Good afternoon, or good morning to those of you joining us from a different time zone. My name is Sarah McChesney, and I'm with ProTech Training. We would like to thank you for joining us today as we explore moving beyond Hadoop, bigger, faster, easier enterprise data science. Today's presentation should be finished at roughly 30 minutes after the hour, and we welcome you to send us any questions during the presentation, and our expert will be happy to answer them at the end. You will find the question area in the top right-hand corner of your screen within the control panel. But for now, please let me introduce you to our presenter. Adam Brindell is a consultant, instructor, and advisor to companies on data engineering and machine learning AI. Adam has been working on related tech for over 21 years and teaching for over, uh, for, in teaching for over 11. He brings real-world experience obtained in consulting on Apache Spark, Dask, machine learning, and data architecture for startups and enterprise clients. Adam's first full-time job in tech was on a neural net-based fraud detection deployed at North America's largest banks back in 1998. After that, he worked with numerous startups where he enjoyed getting to build things like mobile check-in for two of America's five biggest airlines, all of this happening years before the iPhone came out. He's also worked on web, embedded and server apps, as well as on clustering architectures, APIs, and streaming analytics. Adam holds a BA in mathematics from the University of Chicago and an MA in Greek and Latin classics from Brown University. With no further ado, I bring you Adam Brindell. Thanks for that great introduction. I'm going to switch over here to our uh, presentation slides. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, if you're here, uh, it's probably because you do some work with big data or your company does or you're interested in seeing what's next. And so we're going to spend uh, just a little bit of time uh, talking about challenges uh, with some of the existing tools uh, and some of the really nice alternatives uh, that have emerged in the last few years. So challenges with Hadoop and Spark. If you've used Hadoop and Spark, you probably already know a whole lot. You probably could run an entire webinar yourself uh, just talking about the challenges that you or your firm may have had with Hadoop and Spark, right? Uh, it was great technology, uh, but it's getting a little bit long in the tooth, right? This is 15, 20-year-old uh, design patterns, and uh, it works. Uh, but it's not always the easiest thing to use, uh, especially trying to address the newest use cases, especially around data mining, uh, predictive analytics, basically machine learning. Uh, and so, you know, as the world changes and we uh, try to adapt our existing tools, it starts getting more and more expensive. And at some point you, you reach a, a kind of a, a tipping threshold where you want to uh, maybe switch out some of those tools uh, and reclaim some, uh, some more leverage, some more efficiencies. All right, so fundamentally, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Hadoop and Spark because that's not the main topic here, um, but, uh, you know, Hadoop skills are about JVM tuning, Java, Scala, and they don't really align with machine learning skills, right? So uh, there are a few people out there that are really good across this entire spectrum, uh, but we don't want to require our businesses to rely on everyone in our data science team uh, being this kind of jack of all trades. It's, it's really hard to do that. It's sort of like there are great thoracic surgeons and there are great unicyclists. And there's even a few people that can ride the unicycle and they're thoracic surgeons. But if you build your company assuming that you're going to be hiring these unicyclist thoracic surgeons, uh, it's just not going to work, especially for large enterprises. There's, there's no way to scale that. Uh, so as we need to focus on, you know, more skills in uh, machine learning and data analysis, statistics, uh, and languages like Python and R, uh, it's less and less likely that we're going to have the expertise we need uh, to really successfully operate our JVM-based data engineering pipelines. Uh, we have things like Apache Spark that, you know, certainly much easier to use than the early Hadoop tools. Uh, but Spark has, you know, for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit, um, it's, it's starting to maybe uh, decline just a bit. It turns out that it's, it's actually easy to get started, but really, really hard to use right. Uh, and a lot of the knowledge around Spark is this sort of cultural knowledge. If you're not kind of on the right mailing lists and going to the right meetups or the right conferences, it's almost impossible to learn this stuff. Um, and that's really unfortunate, right? We, we want, we're living in this age of democratized information. Everyone has the internet. 
everyone has Amazon. You should be able to buy a book and learn what you need. Uh, and you, you, unfortunately, for various reasons, you just can't. I, I've served as technical reviewer on a bunch of Spark related books for O'Reilly and other publishers. And the, the, the incentives are just not really aligned to get the right information out at the right time to everyone who needs it. So at the end of the day, uh, it's really, really hard uh, to successfully use Spark and, and Hadoop uh, beyond kind of the basics. Uh, one thing I've noticed, and I've, I've uh, consulted with dozens of companies over the last five years, uh, I've taught hundreds, possibly thousands of, of people, uh, about big data engineering, especially with Spark. And what I've noticed is that outside of these big companies, so that this FANG group is, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft, if you work there, they have expertise in-house, uh, the ability to really operate these clusters the way they need. But once you move outside of that group, there's almost zero companies in North America that can really get this stuff working the way they need to. Um, I say North America because there are a number of firms in China that do really well. They've con you know, contributed changes to the code base and they can do whatever they need to. Uh, and there's a few in Europe as well. But North America, outside of this big six, uh, it's really difficult. Uh, the cloud providers don't really have incentives to help people be successful uh, in the way that businesses measure success in terms of efficiency and, you know, being a uh, um, being careful with the the, co the resource cost, right? So the cloud providers, uh, they charge per instance hour, right? So whether it's just the infrastructure like Amazon EC2 or higher up the stack on Amazon with things like EMR or even somebody like Databricks that has a really turnkey solution, they charge per instance hour. So the more resources it takes to do your work, the more expensive your work is, the more money they make. And that, that creates kind of conflicts of interest. Uh, we also have firms like Cloudera, which is, really the only remaining 360 degree support option. Uh, and when I say 360 degree, what I mean is that they can not only support, but they contribute to the code base, they can write their own hot fixes, right? So, you know, anybody can look at your stack trace and, and tell you maybe some ideas to try, but the folks at Cloudera, they have committers on these projects and they can actually make changes to the code uh, if, if it's needed to fix your bug. There's, there's almost nobody left who can do that uh, for the open source tools. We'll talk more a little bit about that. But they also charge per unit of resource. So you may have your servers on-prem, uh, but again, it's like, you know, Cloudera makes more money if you run 100 servers and not 10. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, a couple of really quick war stories. Uh, these are really, really typical. I just picked two out of like dozens. So one was an airline use case. They were running over, uh, well over 50 times uh, as much uh, compute resource and time as they needed for a job. Um, they just, had they and they had even you know sought support from some other firms they just didn't have a good mental model of how the system worked uh, and so they couldn't manage their resource allocation things were taking way too long and costing too much um, on the flip side there was an infosec use case i worked on where they were doing these enormous petabyte level uh, joins and they had a resource deficit of 10 to 30x in other words they weren't putting enough resources on it uh, they didn't have an environment that made it easy to, to adjust that. And then they started making compromises to get stuff to run at all on this fractional environment, and it just kind of spiraled down. And these are just, you know, you see this stuff all day long. Uh, so these are just a couple of, uh, a kind of a couple technical aspects that make this difficult. Um, on the business decision-making side, it's also quite tricky. Uh, a few years ago, there were all of these companies uh, in play, Hortonworks, MapR, Cloudera, Databricks. There were smaller startups. There was, you know, folks like Qbol. Uh, things have really consolidated, right? Hortonworks has merged into Cloudera. Um, you know, Cloudera has undergone a number of transitions in terms of people coming and going so that they, they don't have the same resources they used to. Uh, MapR was acquired, I think it was last summer, by HP Enterprise. Uh, so, you know, they're not out there, uh, you know, selling directly. And these were the companies that had committers on these Hadoop projects. These were the companies that could really go to the source code level uh, and produce patches and troubleshoot. Uh, so there are other consultants out there, but typically not at that level. Uh, there's firms like Databricks. Uh, they do a fantastic job with their own version of Spark, but it's not the open source version of Spark, right? They, they don't really support open source Spark. Their business model is to sell their software, which works really well, but then they, they compete against open source Spark with their own platform. 
Uh, and as a result, we've got this community that's kind of shrinking. It's there's there's fewer and fewer people who are in a good uh, position to make major improvements to the platform. Uh, and so things are, are kind of uh, fraying a bit there. Uh, and then of course it's it's also uh, hard to omit the the issue of Oracle. Uh, so uh, you know, re regardless of your relationship with Oracle, uh, they uh, are kind of a long term challenge uh, in terms of things like licensing. Uh, and issues around the JVM, right? So, so these are some of the uh, some of the issues around uh, Spark and Hadoop in a nutshell that I've seen at so many firms. Uh, and what I tried to do was, you know, figure out what is it that these uh, firms really want and need. And it, it turns out that that's not too mysterious, right? So, I broke it down into a couple groups. On the data engineering side. Uh, straightforward programming for a subset of relational operations. So what we mean here is, uh, you know, your projections, filters, joins, you know, all of your basic, or, you know, sorting, your basic SQL style operations. Then we need to be able to extend those uh, for the specifics that the business needs. So performant, easy custom functions. So these are so-called UDFs or user-defined functions. Uh, and, you know, just to pick a, another kind of a random war story from last week, I have an associate who was working at a large bank and they are building a simple scoring function uh, for their customers. Well, the logic for the function is simple and the underlying platform is simple, but getting those two to work together in a performant way uh, is really, really difficult. Uh, you know, the keyword being performant, right? Getting Hello World to run is easy, but getting it to scale is not always so easy. Uh, what these data engineers would really like is an intuitive model for scale-out parallelism. Uh, the, you know, the Spark and Hadoop model is really, uh, the early Hadoop model was a little bit intuitive. Spark, I've found, is just very counterintuitive for folks. Uh, and then last, informative visual tools for tuning and troubleshooting, so you can figure out what's going on. Now, over on the machine learning and AI side, uh, of course, everybody's using these traditional tools, you know, logistic regression and random forests, and that's great. Uh, but companies are increasingly wanting to do things that don't play well with Hadoop and Spark. Uh, so things like gradient boosting, right? XGBoost, like GBM, general gradient boosting machines. Uh, you might have noticed that XGBoost has a Spark package, but you know, it's one of these, uh, you know, under the hood, it actually works around Spark, so it doesn't use Spark. If you're running Spark and Spark XG Boost, you're actually paying to support two complicated distributed systems just so that you can say that you have two. And in fact, the, the XG Boost part kind of basically kicks Spark to the curb while it's running. Um, so that, that's not super, super helpful. Uh, same thing with deep neural networks, right? So Spark has a lot of um, features to kind of support other tools doing neural nets. But if you're doing deep learning, really Spark is kind of in the way, it's not helping. Uh, and you know, neural networks, obviously, uh, extremely successful for things like natural language, image processing, signal processing. Uh, and more and more firms are getting into uh, modeling uh, for solving problems using things like reinforcement learning. We're seeing a lot of price, you know, uh, revenue management systems adopting reinforcement learning models, uh, Bayesian modeling, uh, agent-based modeling or simulations. Uh, so if you think about um, uh, for example, uh, you know, complex systems uh, like factories, supply chains, uh, there are, you know, whole agent-based uh, simulation models for figuring out, uh, you know, what's going to happen if you make adjustments there. Um, optimizing for business outcomes with custom loss functions. It's basically a fancy way of saying that maximum likelihood on your parameters is not always what you actually want to maximize. Usually the business wants to maximize something related to customers and dollars, uh, and that's not always necessarily the same as just uh, learning the best parameters for your model. So these are all things that don't really play well with Hadoop and Spark. Uh, they're not terribly hard to do. There's lots of data scientists that are brilliant at all of these techniques, but then if you give them this Spark Hadoop platform, uh, we run into trouble. Uh, and last, you know, on a planning and risk mitigation uh, uh, point of view, uh, these are these are kind of standard enterprise requirements, right? If we're for enterprises, we want proven technology, large community hireable skill set, right? Going back to that you know, unicycling thoracic surgeon. If you can't hire a whole bunch of these folks, um, it may not be a realistic tech stat. Uh, broad support, right? We don't want open source that's just from volunteers because that can be fragile. 
We also don't want single vendor open source, right? There's a number of big prominent open source packages that are effectively supported by only a single vendor. Uh, and that makes things a little risky. We like tools like in the Python world where we have support from foundations, nonprofits, scientific institutions, uh, really kind of a, a lot of, a lot of uh, robustness in this network of support. Uh, and that also helps with the last point, which is minimizing the risk of vendor lock-in and, and conflicts of interest. So I've talked a bit about uh, how uh, Python is one of the, the major tools that we want to switch to. Uh, and the question is, how do we scale Python to get the speed and uh, scale out performance that we want, uh, which is you know, sort of the, the thing that brought Hadoop to prominence in the first place. Uh, if you've ever used Python, you know that as a language, it's extremely straightforward, not hard to learn. Uh, but the standard runtime called C Python is not terribly fast. Uh, luckily, Python, uh, from very early days, has supported deep extensibility. And so because of this extensibility, there are tools that allow us to scale out and scale up to much, much better performance. Uh, so using tools like NumPy, uh, we have native data types and vectorized native mathematical implementations. Uh, so by vectorized, it means doing operations on many records at once. Um, by native data types and implementations, we mean uh, using platform data types like floats and ints uh, rather than a Python object. Uh, and by native implementations, we mean code that's written in C, C++. Um, if we want to go even faster with things like GPU, uh, we have drop-in replacements like CuPy that allow us to uh, do even more operations uh, in parallel using uh, specialized hardware. Uh, thanks to NVIDIA, over the last couple of years, we now have an open source project called Rapids that offers easy hardware acceleration um, of a lot of common uh, data science and machine learning tasks, things like tabular, ML, graph analysis um, on GPU. Uh, there's just-in-time compilation. So the NumbaJIT project uh, will perform vectorization for you and can compile to CPU, GPU, and a few other specialized targets. Uh, for scaling out to our big clusters, we have things like Dask. Uh, which makes it easy to scale on a single laptop to data sets much bigger than memory, uh, or to lots of devices, so lots of cores, nodes, uh, or GPUs. Uh, we don't have time in a short presentation like this to run a bunch of code, um, but I couldn't resist including just a few, uh, a couple of lines of code from one of my favorite demo notebooks when we uh, work on this kind of uh, technology, where we want to do a little bit of benchmarking. And if you kind of eyeball this from top to bottom, we're looking at the time involved in computing something like square root on a million numbers. Well, first, we do it in the naive Python way, and it takes uh, about 111 milliseconds. Uh, using NumPy, without really writing any you know, special code, we get that down um, something like 60 or 70x to about one and a half milliseconds. Uh, throwing on just-in-time compilation gets us another 30 or 40 percent savings, and now we're in the microsecond range. And then at the very bottom, you can see that pushing this onto a GPU, uh, we can cut that down by more than 10x. So from top to bottom, we're looking at well over a thousand x speed up uh, in um, in terms of uh, performance. That's kind of the, the basic framework. I want to talk a few minutes about Dask and then a few minutes uh, in more detail about this hardware acceleration. Uh, so Dask is an open source library for Python. Uh, these images here are right from the Dask homepage, if you're wondering uh, where these uh, pictures come from. Uh, and the, the tagline there is really accurate. Dask natively scales Python. So this is not a JVM tool. It's not written in C++. It's a, a fundamentally a Python library that makes it really easy to perform uh, data engineering and data science tasks or pretty much any programming uh, at scale using real Python. Uh, there's a few images underneath here, and I'm not going to dive into too much detail on exactly how this works, at least not, not from, from this image here. Um, but just at the 30,000 foot view, you can see that Dask is designed to work with the projects that your data scientists already know. So your data scientists are already using NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn, and Dask is designed to work with that, not to reproduce a special subset of that in kind of the strange walled garden 
uh, like some other systems do. So it's kind of a really smooth on-ramp uh, for data scientists. Uh, Dask offers a bunch of ways to interact with your data. So these are some of the main interfaces. There's a data frame API, um, and it lives on top of Pandas or Kudi apps. So um, ra again, rather than reinventing the wheel here, it's just a way of scaling uh, Pandas or QDF, which is a GPU accelerated data frame, scaling that out. Uh, so we have data frame, kind of tabular data, tensors, uh, which you, you may be familiar with from the deep learning world or just from scientific computing. Uh, there's a, a interface called BAG, which is an unordered collection, a bit like a Spark RDD. So if you're, if you kind of have that, that makes a lot of sense in your head or you've got uh, software based on that model, uh, you can do it that way. Uh, and then there are some uh, more advanced pieces like Dask Delayed or an implementation of Python's concurrent.futures.future class that allow you to very easily create custom parallelization and, and uh, algorithms that uh, schedule their own tasks in, in real time. So it's very uh, open-ended and again, just using normal Python APIs. Uh, and the last one here is the newest addition to Dask, which is an actor interface. So if you wanna build a distributed actor or agent system, uh, where these agents can send messages and pass objects uh, to each other, uh, which is, you know, again, really useful in simulation uh, type models. Um, that, uh, that's a, another interface you can use to work with Dask. Uh, one of the coolest things about Dask from a practical point of view, and that's why I prepared this animation here, is that uh, unlike a lot of these other systems, it has a ton of real-time animated graphical UIs. Uh, so one of the big mysteries with things like Spark is what the heck is happening in my cluster? Uh, there is a web interface for Spark, but it's, it's very primitive if you used it. I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with that. Uh, here we can see in Dask, in, this is what's going on right now is we're just training a machine learning model if you're wondering what's this actual piece of code that's running. Um, but, and this is a, a small selection of the Dask UI running in Jupyter. You can see real-time memory usage and CPU utilization. You can see exactly which, which tasks are being scheduled on which cores. Uh, you can see communication and tasks being sent around the cluster between the scheduler and four nodes. Uh, you can see the status of different tasks that are scheduled to run, uh, whether they've been scheduled, whether they're occupying memory, whether the results have, have been completed. Uh, so that's kind of a you know really quick uh, animation snippet that I grabbed there, but uh, one of these really nice aspects to Dask is you can see what's going on, and that makes it a whole lot easier to tune and troubleshoot. Uh, and there are further UIs, I'm not going to show you all of them, but one that I thought was worth calling out in addition is there is a visual profiler, so you don't need to bolt on other tools. Uh, we can automatically go ahead and look at flame graphs uh, and see exactly where in the stack we're spending our time. So, uh, you know, right out of the gate, you have this visibility that allows you to, to really work with what you know, uh, instead of having to defer to uh, specialist engineers on the infrastructure to tell you why you're, say, running out of memory, which is kind of a classic challenge. Uh, the docs for, for Dask are particularly robust. So obviously you've got APIs and tutorials, uh, but there's a lot of detail on things like scheduler, performance tuning, best practices, case studies. Uh, these are the things that even today are almost impossible to find in the Spark world. If you want to get the stuff in the Spark world, you're looking at spending a lot of time at conferences and even then trying to filter out kind of, you know, who's just showing off their project and who's actually solving, uh, solving problems in, in general. And uh, having this stuff surfaced just makes it so much easier to get started. So with Dask, uh, you get your data scientists ready to just go straight to reading large-scale data sets from your data lake. So things like, you know, your Parquet files and ORC files, uh, you know, using the skills they already have to transform featureized data sets, create visualizations, uh, create models, uh, and actually focus directly on the business goals. So you're not having a situation where your data scientists get stuck and have to go to a data engineering team and ask, well, how do we, you know, how do we perform this query in a way that's not going to seize up the whole cluster? Or what is this weird hive error? Uh, you know, I'm thinking if you've, if you've used those systems, you're probably familiar with that whole, how that whole workflow kind of goes back and forth. Uh, 
So the last uh, major thing I want to talk about here, uh, we said Dask gets you scaling out to lots of cores, lots of machines, or even lots of GPUs. Uh, but what about the, the coding for a GPU itself? Uh, in the old days, if you looked at coding for a GPU, you probably knew that it's very fast, but it's not very easy. Uh, luckily, that's changed, right? So the future is uh, definitely about heterogeneous compute. There's lots of different compute hardware out there now, from CPUs to Google's TPUs, uh, things like uh, Crosspoint, uh, neuromorphic chips, someday uh, quantum chips. Um, what we can do today is to take these GPUs, which are readily available, and do a lot more with them. So instead of just doing number crunching, uh, we can use things like QDF, which gives us an interface like Pandas, including all of the string manipulation on GPU. Uh, QML, which is designed to behave like scikit-learn, but run on GPU. Uh, a few of the other components to Rapids that I've mentioned listed here, uh, things like QSpatial, which is for GIS spatial processing, uh, QSignal for signal processing, and some underlying libraries for accelerated I.O. and uh, string manipulation on GPU. Uh, one of the most exciting projects down at the very bottom is Blazing SQL, which I'll show you at the very end. Uh, and that's a SQL engine that performs your SQL queries on GPU and even across multiple GPUs. Uh, some benchmarks that NVIDIA has shared. Uh, if you're not totally convinced of the uh, performance differential here, uh, what we've got are various cluster sizes using CPU nodes, and those are Apache Spark clusters, and you can see the spec at the bottom. They have 61 gigs of memory, uh, eight cores on a 64-bit OS running Apache Spark. Uh, you can see the timing, even with 100 CPU nodes, is substantially slower, uh, more than 10x slower, and in some cases, even more than that, uh, over some of these GPU-accelerated solutions, and that's with 100 nodes. Right, so uh, using GPU clusters or even just a single GPU server, like uh, the DGX2 box that's illustrated on here is a single server with a number of GPU cards in it, uh, we can substantially outperform even pretty massive uh, CPU-based clusters. So the very last thing that I wanted to, to show was um, uh, in terms of new tooling, uh, is this Blazing SQL. And this is, uh, again, we don't have time to run the code, but I grabbed a little tiny piece of a notebook just so you can see, makes it feel a little bit more real uh, and see what it looks like. Uh, Blazing SQL lets you take regular SQL. And you can see in the second cell on this notebook, I have a query that involves, you know, grouping and ordering and filtering and whatnot, including uh, some string manipulation. And we can go ahead and run this on one or more GPUs across one or more servers. Uh, and we get a result back that is a QDF data frame. So it feeds directly from our SQL feature extraction into our uh, you know, more refined feature processing pipeline or our reporting pipeline on the, the uh, data science side. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, I can do things like uh, grab a few records, just say two pandas, and now I can, you know, do my pandas uh, plotting. So a really nice integration between SQL, uh, GPU acceleration, and uh, normal single node Python libraries like pandas. Uh, so this slide is, a, is an NVIDIA slide that they share, and I, I, I borrowed it because I really like the way they've kind of laid out the problem. Uh, with one axis being scaling up to fancier hardware. So in the lower left, we have our PyData stack with all of our you know, normal uh, Python data tools that we love. Uh, going on the, this Y axis going up, we can bring in GPUs and run all that stuff uh, a whole lot faster on a bigger machine. Uh, going to the right, we can scale out across lots of cores and or lots of nodes using Dask. Uh, and then in the upper right, we can combine these two things together, right? So because Dask is just Python, uh, Dask can orchestrate stuff using Rapids. And this technology, OpenUCX, that's mentioned in there is a, a hardware agnostic accelerated transport. Uh, it's open source. So if you just have Ethernet, that's great. Uh, but if you have uh, uh, some kind of uh, optical fiber, NVLink, um, in FinaBand, you've got fancier transport. Uh, OpenUCX allows you to do these shuffles and these internode communication uh, faster using the best hardware uh, that you have. 
So that's pretty much uh, kind of the very quick tour of kind of the past and uh, present of uh, accelerated data science. Um, a few of the companies using these tools, if you're, uh, if you're wondering, uh, just grabbed a few, uh, Walmart, NASA, Capital One, uh, Los Alamos National Labs, Barclays, uh, Sidewalk Labs, which is uh, pretty famous uh, for some of the stuff they're doing in Toronto. That's a Google Alphabet company. Um, so lots of people using this, and you'll find more about that if you, if you look them up on the web. And I think we've got a few minutes for uh, some Q&A, so I'll take a look and see if we have any uh, questions. Actually, Adam, I've got some questions that have come in, if, uh, if I can go ahead and read them to you. Oh, perfect. First question is, where does PySpark fit in? How does it combine Python and Spark? Ah, so that's that's a really good question. So, um, yeah, so PySpark, when it first came out, was a really cool idea. Like, oh, you can program Spark, but you can use Python. Um, but it's turned out that, except for a few special cases, it's 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 not quite so straightforward because underneath the hood, the Spark system is still Scala and JVM, uh, and so. Uh, although PySpark gets you around you know, some of the language issues, it doesn't really solve the, uh, the deeper issues around uh, parallelization, and it doesn't really work like Python. PySpark is not really Python. It's just a Python wrapper. Um, and I also just mention if you've come across the project called Koalas, you might have seen something called Koalas. Uh, Koalas is a PySpark interface that's meant to look like pandas. Um, I'm also, I have to be honest, it's, it's nice that people created that, but I'm not a huge fan because uh, it makes it look like pandas, but it doesn't work like pandas. So Koalas makes it, and PySpark, make it even easier to write something that looks like normal Python, but totally blows up when you go to run it. Uh, and so I feel like the issues, the ones that I've seen in consulting with folks, go a little bit deeper. It's not really about the syntax, it's about having a good mental model of what's going on. Great. Um, I'll move on to the next question. And just a reminder, anyone that um, would still like to submit a question for us to answer today, please go ahead and enter that into the question area in the control panel. The second question, what about other scale out Python frameworks like Ray? And then they have in brackets as compared to Dask. Oh, yeah, that's another great question. So you may have heard uh, about this project called Ray. Uh, it's from the RISE lab at UC Berkeley. That's actually the same, uh, sort of the same group in the UC Berkeley computer science department that produced things like Apache Mesos and Spark five or 10 years ago. Well, more than five years ago, so almost 10 years ago. Uh, it's a really interesting framework, uh, and it, it does allow you to parallelize Python uh, but I think it's a little bit early days to see how well that's going to, to work. It's, it's very complex under the hood because unlike Dask, which was written by practitioners to try and solve their own problems, Ray is kind of a research project. And it's a really cool research project, don't get me wrong, but it's written in C++. It's, it's very complex uh, because its goal is to preserve the state of distributed actor systems under some really extreme circumstances. Uh, and then it has these language wrappers on top. Uh, so I think it's maybe worth keeping an eye on, especially for some of the special use cases they're pushing, like reinforcement learning and uh, hyperparameter optimization. But it's it's not really Python, and it's uh, I think it might be a little bit a little bit too complex to, to successfully use in a lot of enterprise environments. Great. Uh, the next question: Nvidia DGX servers are expensive. How can I make use of GPU technology on a smaller budget? Oh, that's, an, that's another great, great question. Yeah, so those DGX servers, which appeared in the slide, uh, the NVIDIA benchmark slide, uh, you might have seen those and said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're really fast because they've got, you know, even the small ones got 16 GPUs and it, you know, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but you actually don't, you know, obviously, it, since NVIDIA was doing the benchmarks, they're using their own servers, but you don't have to do that. Uh, to use uh, NVIDIA GPU technology. Uh, first of all, if you're running on-prem, you can just buy the NVIDIA server card. So whatever, whoever sub normally supplies your uh, servers, whether it's like you know Dell or HP or whoever, uh, they can sell you 
the appropriate cards, and they're, they're not that expensive. You can just plug them into your server if you're running on-prem. What's even easier if you're running in the cloud is all of these instances are readily available on the major cloud providers, and they're not very expensive. So um, when I was preparing the benchmark that I demoed here today, I spun up a server with an NVIDIA Tesla T4 uh, GPU in um, Amazon EC2. And just, you know, in case people are seeing this in the future, this, this is from, you know, the prices here from March uh, 2020. Uh, and I grabbed a spot instance for something like 21 cents an hour. Um, I think if you want to get the full on-demand price, you're looking at maybe 50 cents an hour, but that's for a full server with, uh, with the GPU. So um, uh, the pricing, and I think that the Google Cloud pricing is maybe even a little bit lower. So uh, it's a pretty smooth on-ramp if you want to try some of these things, even if you want to scale out to, you know, five or 10 uh, or a larger number of GPU servers, uh, the, the cost involved uh, using the cloud providers is not terribly high. So that's kind of a, an easy way to get started. Great. Well, um, that actually concludes all the questions that have come in. And um, so just, uh, just in closing, we wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Adam, it's very apparent that you're a super smart guy. And thank you so much for giving us your time and expertise today. If you don't mind putting up the uh, closing slide that just has a little bit of contact information, this uh, final screen will let you know how to reach us by phone or by email, should you wish to delve deeper into learning with ProTech and with Adam. Uh, you may also uh, go to our website, protechtraining.com, and visit our resource section, and that lists some upcoming webinars, uh, includes some past webinar recordings on a variety of different topics, and as well as some uh, articles that may be of interest. We do have a couple of upcoming uh, webinars and free classes that speak specifically to some of the challenges that we're all facing these days, touching upon dealing with stress in uncertain times, as well as overcoming challenges of recently having to work from home with distractions like children and spouses um, at home too. So you may visit our website to get more information on those and to register. ProTech, just so you know, has been delivering live instructed uh, our live instructor-led virtual training for almost two out of our three decades in business. And uh, we couldn't be better prepared for the delivery of training um, to, to your home office that's going on these days. So um, by all means, keep that in mind. And just again, a thank you for taking your time and joining us. And Adam, again, thank you very much for your time and wishing everyone a great day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.